before I show the film, I wanted to say something about my last chapter of the War Crimes book, which is on the archives. And the, the chapter is methodologically shaped by a, a brief um, essay that the Lewis wrote, actually delivered it as a talk um, on the drama of concepts. <laughs> For every concept, he says, there's a historical drama. And so the concept of the archive is something that I begin with, suggesting that there's no clear way to define what an archive is, but rather it's best to look at how historically it's been invented, and especially that it has been focused this time on very forms of fixation, like in buildings, fixed with documents, and so the archive is associated with documents and buildings. What's interesting about this film is that Jimmy Miracatani is a vernacular archivist and it's constructed in the street. It's kind of a shadow archive that no one knows about until the documentary is made, and then it becomes, then it comes out. But anyway, the guts of the chapter is based on a novel. The War Crimes book has kind of bookends of two novels. The one by Matthias and Art called Zone that I talked about. And one by Laszlo Kazma Horkai, a Hungarian, called War and War. And in War and War, the main character, what I call the aesthetic subject, is a man named Korin, K-O-R-I-N. And I think that the fact that his name begins with K um, is a uh, kind of a gesture for the author. All of the caves and often. Anyway, Corin is an archivist at a small peripheral town on the outskirts of Budapest, and he discovers a manuscript. But as you read the novel, it becomes clear that, it's, that the manuscript may have been invented by Corin rather than actually being discovered. But because he regards this as a very important manuscript, he wants to put it, make it permanent. And what the permanence for him is taking it to New York and putting it on the internet, basically. Um, because, as he says, New York is the new Rome. And, and he's referring to the Vatican that in our conference. But anyway, uh, I'm going to read you a little bit of, this, of, of, of the way the novel works. Krasner Horkheim's Corin is by his own admission, losing his identity coherence. As his work on the manuscript proceeds, he's a disintegrating persona. Quote, something in me is breaking up and I'm getting tired, end quote. And rather than turning inward, he aggressively externalizes his fractured self. In Jacques Lacan's words, quote, this is from uh, one of the Lacan seminars, he throws back on the world the disorder of which he is composed. That's the, the psychic mechanism that Lacan talks about. Nevertheless, Corn is not a static self. Early in the novel, after he gets to New York, he refers to himself as a head archivist in waiting, quote, unquote with a lot to do to prepare himself for the task, not the least of which is acquiring and becoming competent in a computer. And so it turns out he only speaks Hungarian, and so he moves into a, uh, a uh, apartment that's run by a Hungarian who can help him figure out where to go. And the Hungarian takes him to 47th Street Photo. That's an old institution in New York. It's a discount computer and camera store. Basically. And so he buys a computer there. For the first time in history, for at least, the so-called internet offered a practical possibility of immortality. For there were so many computers in the world by then that computers were for all practical purposes indestructible. And that which is indestructible must perforce be immortal, he says. Okay. Corin's musings on the internet resonate with his perspective on New York as the new Rome. The implication being that the internet is a better place than the Vatican archive to secure the immortality of the text. Doubtless that is the case in part because the open access of the internet implicates countless witnesses to the documents, whereas the Vatican archive has opened itself very slowly. And I have a section in which I talk about the history of the Vatican archive and the way in which it has been opened by various kinds of popes, although in very selective ways. For example, there's all sorts of evidence that Pope Pius could have intervened with the Nazis to save Jews, but he refused to. Uh, and the Vatican won't release that, that evidence, for example. While working on the manuscript, Corrin is also in the process of inventing himself as an American as an, and as a New Yorker. He's what I call a becoming subject, one who is 
and this is a quote from Bakhtin, axiologically yet to be. That's one of the things that uh, M.M. Bakhtin says about authors in literature. The author is always axiologically yet to be. Axiology is about ethics, in other words, becoming an ethical subject. The difference is largely a function of Koren's self-fashioning, self-destruction that he's decided to embrace. At one point, he inquires as to whether the entire notion of America had ultimately come about as a result of his decision to end his life once the archive was completed. With respect to his more specific location, his New York experiences make him delirious. The traffic made him dizzy. He was in constant fear of assault at every road and traffic sign. At this stage, Koren is a prey to the dizzying effect that Georg Zimmel famously attributes to the metropolis. However, as Koren continues exploring the city on foot, urban impressions become increasingly a stimulus to critical reflection. And one of the things I talk about is the way in which his situation in the city shapes his interpretation of the manuscript and his situation in the apartment building as well. Um, he has to verbalize what he's thinking all the time. And Mr. Savary, the Hungarian who runs the apartment building, has a housekeeper lover who's always in the kitchen. And she never even looks at Corin, but he talks to her back and he tells her what he's thinking constantly and verbalizes it. Um, Okay, the novel implicates the spatial determination of Koren's creativity. The architecture of the apartment in which he dwells affects his reading and inventing process. On the one hand, there's the privacy of his room, where Koren enters the manuscript into the computer file. On the other, there's the apartment's kitchen, effectively the apartment's public sphere, where he attempts to communicate his insights about the manuscript to the woman, the lover housekeeper, the interpreter landlord. Moreover, the various doors and walls aid his work process. They allow him to avoid, avoid the censorious presence of the interpreter who inhibits his attempt at publicity, occasionally attempting to bar his access to the woman interlocutor with whom Cora needs to communicate. For example, here's what Cora says. He had read it through it countless times, thought Cora, as he sat in the kitchen the next day, when after a long period of silence behind the door, he judged that the interpreter must be out of the way. For really, he'd been through it at least five, maybe 10 times, but the manuscript's mystery was by no means diminished. Even as he continued devouring the pages, the mystery obscured by the unknowable and in inexplicable was more important than anything else, by now impossible to shake. He felt no great need to try to explain his own actions to himself, to ask why he should have dedicated the last few weeks of his life to this extraordinary labor since what, after all, did it consist of? He asked the woman rhetorically. <clears throat> One of the things that Immanuel Kant suggests about the, the dynamic of experience is that it's not complete until it's communicated. Right? At first, you're affected by something, and then you impose a form on it, but then the last step, which Kant explicates in his anthropology, is communicating it, and then the experience is consummated, as it were. The rhythm of the novel basically articulates what I would call a phenomenology of perception. And one of the interesting things about this novel, very much like Ennard's, is it's got very long sentences that have an important rhythm to them. Ennard's novel has one sentence for the entire novel. Krasner Horkai's novel is about one sentence per chapter, basically, as it rushes along. Um, let me just read you this. This is an amazing passage, and then I'll stop. The rhythms of Krasner Horkai's novel articulate a phenomenology of perception. For example, in this passage, on the beauty of a flight attendant who helps Corin get his visa paper so he can board the plane to New York. Although the passage may seem to be an irrelevant aside, it's exemplary, okay? And here's how he describes the flight attendant. The nipples delicately pressed through the warm texture of the snow white starch blouse, while deep decolletage boldly accentuates the graceful curvature and fragility of the neck. The gentle valleys of the sole shoulders and the light swaying to and fro of the sweetly compact masses of her breasts. Although it was hard to tell whether it was these that drew the eyes inexorably to her, that refused to let the eyes escape, or was it the short dark blue skirt that clung to her hips that arrested them? In other words, men and women caught in the moment. They stared quite openly, the men with crude, long suppressed hunger and naked desire, the women with a fine attention to the accumulation of detail dizzy with sensation, but driven by a malignant jealousy at the heart of their fierce inspection. An amazing passage, okay, and here's what I say about it. 
The seeming aside on how beauty achieves its effects, beauty as a drama of encounter, is illustrative. It serves as a preview of the phenomenological density of the parallel simultaneous texts, Krasnohorkai's, the novel, and Koren's, the manuscript that he's talking about, which treat the ways in which the creation of the history of war archives is a function of events of encounter, the interactive dramas through which the archives have been assembled as archiving subjects confront others whose presence disrupt the tendency toward a proprioceptive and non-reciprocal relationship to the world. Thus, in War and War, the name of the novel, there's a dual dramatic narrative, one involving the encounters that shape the archivist's work of reading and inscription, the other, the contrived encounters of the characters in the manuscript which shape their tale as they serve as aesthetic subjects in a chronotope of historical encounter. A chronotope is a time-based set of things. Okay. Um, I wanted to read you about Krasno Horkai because it's such a fantastic novel. It's really unbelievable. It captured my imagination and shaped the entire chapter on the archives. Okay. Um, I then go later to another archivist. That's Jimmy Mirakatani. Um, and so we can show the film. she was just going to make a documentary of a Japanese street artist who happened to do cats. It turns out that Jimmy Mirakatani was interned during World War II for two and a half years. And his family, he was born in Sacramento. He was, he, his family moved him to Hiroshima when he was three years old. As a young man <clears throat> in the late 30s, he came back to the United States because he didn't want to join the Japanese military. And his family in Hiroshima were wiped out. And so two kinds of atrocity, basically, the bombing on the one hand and the internment on the other, uh, which comes out as the documentary proceeds. The film basically articulates two temporalities. One is, the, is documentary time, right? The seasons begin to change as the documentary builds and the thematic begins to shift once Linda finds out what his history is, then 9-11 happens and it changes dramatically. But at the same time, as Jimmy said, this is history, you know, in other words, the temporality which is displayed in his work. If anyone ever says, a film can't make a difference, <laughs> you know, here's an example that's just amazing. You know? Among the many things, aside from the fact of restoring his citizenship and getting him an apartment and all that, the fact that he died no longer angry is just... I'm sorry, he died no longer? He no longer angry. Angry. Right, remember? Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the professor of art history from uh, Missouri said that, you know, he discovered how angry Jimmy is. And at the very end, he says, I'm not angry anymore. There's this passage um, in Blanchot's Unavowable Community um, that at some point Blanchot says that um, community happens or uh, meets in, in a certain silence mm -hmm. that there's no kind of a meeting uh, in, 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 in a material spoken way and what I felt was that at the end of the movie you feel something there's this a kind of silence that connects so yeah. many things in silence but there's something yeah. there happening yeah. well, Ranciere talks about it as in terms of communities of sense, sense. and the one thing that became quite clear given the emotional resonances that it produces for us that the community of sense is a lot bigger than his extended family that it connects us with him. Where does he talk about this, Mike? Um, there's an edit, well, many places, but there's an edited volume on his work. Um, I forgot, at Duke, 
And um, the last essay in there is Ranciere himself talking about communities of sense. Mike, just a question relates to that. Uh, I could imagine that this this would have close relation to his approach to aesthetics and, and the politics of aesthetics. Yeah, very much so, yeah. And his stuff on film, uh, one of the things he says is that the aesthetic regime of the arts, in the aesthetic regime of the arts, the narrative as a whole is less important than the individual images. Philosophy, the Japanese use aesthetic metaphors much more than logical ones. It's simply called conversation with a Japanese student. But you can imagine how Linda's apartment was kind of transformed. You know, you put, you know, you're not supposed to pick that stuff. Yeah, but I'm going to put it in the apartment. <laughs> I'm going to bring the inside, the outside inside, you know, and transform the, the feeling of the place. Let me just read you my conclusion for the whole the chapter and uh, the book for that matter, and then we get back to the film. By way of conclusion, I want to emphasize what's been involved as I've invited literary productions and testimonies into the historical archive that bears on the politics of justice. Jacques Rancière raises a relevant question and suggests an answer. A well-known Aristotelian sentence says that human beings are political because they own the power of speech that puts into, the, into common the issues of justice and injustice, while animals have only voice to express pleasure or pain. It would seem to follow the, from this that politics is the public discussion on matters of justice among people who are able to do it. But there's a preliminary matter of justice how do you recognize that the person who is mouthing a voice in front of you is discussing matters of justice rather than simply expressing his or her private pain? 
The preliminary question to which Rancia refers opens the question of a politics of recognition. While the proceedings of tribunals must be involved with selecting specific indictable perpetrators and specific evidence-worthy testimony, the literary archive that has occupied my attention opens the problem of justice to an ethical political negotiation in which the list of potentially qualified participants cannot be closed. The additional question I want to emphasize has to do with our responsibility to those who have yet to be heard. The narrator is A.D. Smith's story, which I talk about in the preface, evokes the relevant issue of attention in referring to the reason why the people in the vicinity of the Cambodian embassy in London ignore atrocities. The fact is, she says, if we followed the history of every little country in this world, we would have no space left in which to live our lives or to apply ourselves to necessary tasks, end quote. In my first citation of that remark, I suggest that the story implies that the hiddenness of war crimes and atrocities is owed as much to the psychic suppressions of the phenomenology of everyday life as it is to the suppression strategies of government-controlled media. Think about the phenomenology of everyday life in terms of all of us getting up in the morning and kind of facing our day, and then seeing something like this which basically disrupts you know, the, the, our emotional rhythms and makes us focus for a while. And then perhaps we'll um, put it away again. Here I want to turn from the phenomenology to ethics and draw on some remarks made by Slavoj Žižek in an analysis of the ethical position that emerges from the novels of Henry James. With James, Žižek presumes that there is, quote, no ethical substance which provides fixed coordinates for our ethical judgment in advance. But such a judgment can emerge only from our own work of ethical reflection with no eternal guarantee. And suggests its implications, quote, the lack of fixed frame of reference, far from simply condemning us to moral relativism, opens up a higher field of ethical experience, that of intersubjectivity, the mutual dependence of subjects, the need not only to rely on others, but also to recognize, and this is the expression I love, the ethical weight of others' claims on me. In my last sentence, my hope is that my investigation has allowed some others to overcome institutionalized practices of distraction and inattention to weigh in and perpetually speak to the ear of the future. The ear. The ear of the future. Anyway, here is this Japanese street person who can take a look inside as this couple is looking through the plastic sheeting at one point. What's that? What's that? What's that? And here's a life that's so incredibly anonymous. Right? And in effect, um, Linda draws him out of his historical situation and makes it public um, and therefore makes a claim on us to pay attention. Not only for that, but for countless others. What do we owe to the history of the suffering of others? What kind of recognition? What's our responsibility with respect to that? If you're an IR person, do you go on with your usual security analysis? <laughs> or do you want to reinflect your duty to the to the discipline as a result of seeing something like this? This picture on television, that picture in the street. The fact that 9 11 was basically doing the same thing about the Arabs they did with the Japanese people. It is bizarre how 
who says it's a stupid country. Yeah. You haven't learned anything from experience. Yeah, right, yeah. Same old story, Jimmy says. Yeah, same, old same, old same old story. Yeah. Can't make war, everything hashes, he says. And then we see this bombed out um, Afghan village, for example, in which everything's been decimated. And, you know, there's a lot of psychodynamic aspects in that. Thing. There's a very old book that's really terrific by a Dane, Sven Ronald, that's called Moral Indignation and Middle Class Psychology. And one of the things that Ronald um, argues is that um, we're all controlled in certain ways, and we resent our control. There's certain <coughs> feelings we'd like to be able to express, certain things we'd like to be able to do, but we learn to control ourselves. But some people don't exercise the same controls. They don't do it. Right? And instead of thinking about our own controls, we get resentful. We want to destroy them for not being like us, because like us is include some things we hate. <laughs> and then we externalize them. And we keep them. Which speaks a lot to the politics yeah. of identity. Yeah. I was on a, an airplane once, and uh, there was a Middle Eastern family. And it was, you know, finally the, the serving carts are out of the aisle, so everyone wants to use the bathroom. Right? And so their cues at the bell. Well, the father, the patriarch of this extended family on the plane, went to use the bathroom. And when he finished, he stood in the doorway and summoned his wife from her seat, rather than honoring the queue that had lined up. Right? You should have seen the, the anger and the moral indignation, right? but it's based on a sort of different protocols this person had with respect to, you know, and what, do you, what do you heed, who's, who's next, and all that, all that sort of thing. An incredible confrontation there. The, the flight attendants had to, you know, intervene to avoid a near riot, as it were. People were shouting and swearing and so forth. At the beginning, I had talked a bit about the development of the relations between them. And I saw that at the beginning, like her approach was really to do you need anything? How are you? Put yeah. this jacket on, you're going to be cold. And his reaction maybe was a bit kind of I've been living here for a long time. Though. You don't know anything about it. Yeah. I don't know, but somehow he, he was opening up. Yeah. And then they, they move over and he enters her apartment. Yeah. And at the beginning, he's still more, more quiet or more, I don't know, not, not that positive. But after some time, I think he, maybe you could see it as a daughter father relation, maybe, or something. Then he gets worried or then he really gets angry. And at the same time, you have something kind of a yeah. macho element. Or a bit element there where he kind of puts her, her space in yeah. where, she should, where she's supposed to be or, yeah. or she's supposed to serve him food. And yeah, at the very beginning, Jimmy is her, sub, her subject. Her subject is Jimmy. Yeah. Right? Over time, when she learns Jimmy's story, her subject becomes history, violence. Mm -hmm. like, it just it explodes, it expands. Right? Yeah. It, it kind of took her over, right? mm -hmm. not what she anticipated. It goes back, among other things, to that um, remark that I quoted from M. M. Bakhtin, the Russian literary theorist, mm -hmm. who says that the author is always axiologically yet to be. Mm -hmm. In the process of working, the, the author is in the process of becoming. And she became politically sensitive to things as a result. Mm -hmm. It wasn't this fixed person who did a documentary. It was a person who was affected. Mm -hmm. It's incredible this from this entry point Jimmy as her subject there's this textuality that keeps opening and opening and opening yeah. and, 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 and with that this always structure of the we have been in a sense like always changing 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 yet to be yet to be yet to be one of the things that tells us I think about ethics is that you have to be, allow yourself to be afflicted by the mm -hmm. other. Russell Banks has one novel entitled Affliction. And I think he understands that. I mean, that's what it's about. 
it's, it's about a very sorry life and a person who has all kinds of you know, struggles with his father and so forth. Anyway, affliction. Affliction isn't just negative, affliction is sensitivity. 